Without any further ado, episode three, I'm told just to the United States. Well, now we'll uh, shift to the second portion of our event. Uh, I want to welcome our several uh, panelists uh, to the front table. Uh, while we're getting settled, I'll uh, uh, remind you who they are. Um, so our panelists, you've heard already from Peter Kuznick. Peter is a professor of history at American University. He also founded and directs the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University. Uh, he completed his undergraduate degree in history, so he from Laude and Rutgers, and later earned both his master's and PhD in history at Rutgers as well. He's authored several books, uh, including Beyond the Laboratory, Scientists as Political Activists in 1930s America, published in 1987, which is literally a must-read around here since this important book appears on the required reading list for all of our graduate students' general examinations uh, in the Doctor Program of History, Anthropology, and Science Technology Society. Peter's also co-edited the volume Rethinking Cold War Culture and co-authored the books Rethink the Rethinking the Atomic Bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japanese and American Perspectives, uh, and Nuclear Power and Hiroshima, the Truth Behind the Peaceful Use of Nuclear Power. In addition to his books and scholarly articles, Peter's published widely on history, nuclear issues, and politics in such venues as the New Statesman, USA Today, uh, the Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, among many others. Among his honors, Peter's been selected twice to serve three-year terms as distinguished lecturer by the Organization of American Historians. Uh, his co-panelist, uh, Oliver Stone, of course, is a renowned screenwriter and director. After enrolling at Yale, he left his undergraduate studies to enlist in the U.S. Army in 1967. He served for over a year in Vietnam in the 25th Infantry Division, earning a Bronze Star, an Air Medal, and a Purple Heart. Uh, after returning to the U.S., he completed his undergraduate studies at New York University in 1971. At NYU, he studied filmmaking under such uh, teachers as Martin Scorsese, among others. In 2008, uh, Stone was named Artistic Director of the NYU Tisch School of the Arts Asia Program in Singapore. Uh, as everyone in this room and beyond well knows, um, Mr. Stone has directed more than 20 feature films. These are iconic films for which he was screenwriter, director, or both. They include Midnight Express, Scarface, Platoon, Wall Street, Talk Radio, Born on the Fourth of July, The Doors, JFK, Natural Born Killers, Nixon, Any Given Sunday, W, and most recently Savages, among several others. I'm sure the room will catch the ones I didn't have to skip. Uh, his films to date have garnered nine Academy Awards, ten Golden Globe Awards, uh, and many additional nominations. Together, Oliver Stone and Peter Kuznick wrote a lengthy book entitled The Untold History of the United States, published by Simon and Schuster in 2012, that was to accompany the 12 part uh, documentary series uh, that first aired on Showtime in that same year, 2012. Untold History, the book, has been translated into 10 languages already, and a graphic novel version is in preparation. So it's a great, great honor to welcome both Peter Kuznick and Oliver Stone here to discuss the film uh, that we just saw, of the larger project, and of course to have a discussion with all of you. We have two uh, volunteers from our DACA program who will help pass microphones along, uh, but I wanted to invite our panelists uh, to begin with to uh, set the stage however they uh, would like to in terms of uh, their thinking about the project more broadly, uh, this particular film, whatever they want to say to, to kick it off, and then uh, we'll open up for questions. So, uh, Peter and Oliver, it's, the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Of Henry Wallace and the bomb. 
because we consider them to be the major turning point in 20th century world history. Wallace, as you saw, but the bomb as this, the beginning of the American myth, the, the myth of American exceptionalism. Not that it doesn't go back to 1630 in Massachusetts Harbor with uh, John Winthrop who boarded the Arbella. We do trace it back. But this is key to the modern understanding. And the idea that might makes right, that the United States as God's gift to humanity was justified in dropping the atomic bomb and that, that America, that America's role in the world was going to be sanctified from there on. So we started with this idea, and then we decided we should go back further, or we should take it up further to the, to the present. We ended up going up to 2012. But this was the, the core, the kernel, for our vision to begin with. My version's a little different. <laughs> this, I, it's interesting because a professor will tell you what we became, it became, and I think he's, I think you're giving the conclusion. From my point of view, uh, it was a nightmare uh, in 2008 because I was inspired by George W. Bush uh, in the sense that I thought this was the worst eight years of my life. <laughs> and I had been through Vietnam already twice, I felt, and now I'd have to go through it again. And the war years were terribly depressing to me and to many people. Uh, and I thought it just couldn't get super. So I, I was never having been to a officially study history in college, I really wanted to know, are we always like this, or is this something that goes back uh, in our past? And having known Peter since 1990s, uh, one day he told me the story of this atomic bomb, and uh, because I had been born right around that time, I was, I always accepted the version of the atomic bomb story. Always, it was clear that we had to drop it, because uh, Japan, we had, it was the clean end to the war, and so forth and so on. And, it became, I never saw the pattern that flowed. And then with this, he told me the story of Wallace, because Wallace is the hook to get into the suspense. As a, as a screenwriter, you have to understand what a great story. July 44, coming a month after June 44, or D-Day. D-Day D -Day is always pictured as the great historic event of World War II, the winning, the, sort of the climactic battle, according to uh, uh, Amber, uh, Ambrose. But uh, a month later is a very key event that no one talks about. And Peter tied the event to the atomic bomb, which I think is, is, is logical. And you see that well, my life unfolds from that moment on because we act from 45 on. We act as if we have the God-given power to control the universe. And I very much felt that growing up. My father was a Republican conservative. Grew up in New York City, the most powerful city in the world, Wall Street. Uh, it was a given. I accepted that, and uh, I benefited from it. And I went to Vietnam very much in the belief uh, that we were fighting. I was fighting, and we were fighting communism. And you know, it's in, I'm talking inductively. It just unravels. It starts to unravel from the 60s, 60s on. But I was a slow learner, and I was I, may, I remained very conservative in many ways. And it took me a long time. Through the 70s, I learned an enormous amount from people who'd been to a, a educated actually shared with me a, a different vision of America. And in the 80s, uh, I still was back and, forth, back and forth. And with, uh, I even voted for Reagan in 1980. Uh, because, and I, I voted for Carter in 76, but I, and I really felt that surge of, of optimism that it had turned uh, to uh, a disaster, at least pr as pictured in the media by the 78, 79 period. So I voted for Reagan, and then when I finally went back to Salvador to, with my friend Boyle to see the, to, to, to work on a, an idea of a movie called Salvador, I was so turned off and disgusted by what I saw in the front lines of Honduras and Salvador and Nicaragua. It was clear that Reagan had a strong Vietnam mandate back in place, and he was going back to those days, and the soldiers in the front line, men and women, were telling me, not only that they, uh, they, had, they wouldn't talk much about the mission, but they were unclear about the mission. And certainly they, they professed to have no memory. Even then, this was 1983, even then they, had no, they said they had no memory of Vietnam. It was, it was not debatable. They didn't want to discuss Vietnam. This was only a few years before. So under those, uh, then I made the movie. And after that, I was on the war path in a sense because it was clear to me that we were, we were going to go to war in Nicaragua if it had not been for that. Oliver North disaster sandal, I believe we would have ended up in Nicaragua as we did in Vietnam earlier. So all these
these things came to bear finally in 2008, which is what I was trying to say in the first place. So my conclusions are coming from different. Uh, uh, Peter was always a liberal, I think, from the beginning of his life to the end. I started on the other side of the spectrum completely and despised people like Peter when I was a kid. And, uh, but uh, my God, I've come uh, you know, full circle. But at least you know, it's been uh, it's been a tough education. I'm actually enough of a 60s person to not like to label liberal. Uh, <laughs> you know, liberal were for those weakly, half hearted people. Uh, we had a more radical approach back then. Uh, but with Oliver and I, it was part of what made this collaboration so interesting was that Oliver's a dramatist, I'm a historian. Oliver came at research from a conservative standpoint, I came from much more of a left wing standpoint. So our visions and our skills and our insights actually merged in a way that I hope you thought was very uh, persuasive uh, in, in, this, in this episode. And I want to say one thing about Henry Wallace, because even though he gets dumped from the ticket in 44, Roosevelt begs him to stay in the cabinet. And he gave Wallace his choice of positions, and Wallace made the same choice, strangely, that Herbert Hoover made in 1920 and he took the position of Secretary of Commerce. Wallace stays in the Truman administration as Secretary of Commerce and wages guerrilla warfare, in a sense, from inside the cabinet, where he's kind of trying to convince Truman to take a different approach toward the Soviet Union, trying to convince Truman to turn nuclear weapons over to the United Nations and abolish them completely, trying to prevent Truman from starting the Cold War and the arms race during that time. And, and Truman does that. Wallace fights that for well over a year, and then he gets fired, it's interesting to me, the same week that Oliver was born, <laughs> in September 1946. So Oliver has another connection to, to this history also. I didn't know what was going on then. Let <laughs> <laughs> me take uh, to, to long term so quickly, because a lot of people here work with the government. Uh, the <laughs> so let's, uh, let's, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a big tent. So I wanted to um, take Chair's prerogative and ask um, a quick question to get things going. The, the series is, is entitled The Untold History. I know I've seen in some of the commentary discussions since the book and the films first aired uh, that you've preferred terms like the unlearned history, the never quite well-known history. And so I'm curious about, for this film in particular, for the, for the subject matter of this film, I mean, in some sense, a, a broadly similar argument was made uh, in print as early as 1948 by uh, the physicist Patrick Blackett, uh, the very year that Blackett won the Nobel Prize in physics, uh, where he argued essentially the bomb had been militarily unnecessary, was done as, uh, as a first Cold War move. I mean, it, 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 details might differ, but in broad brushstrokes. And of course, many in the room will know uh, Gar Alperovitz's uh, path-breaking book in 1965, much discussed. Again, details quibble over, but I think the broad brushstrokes would line up with this and Marty Show and many other friends since then. So I wonder, um, basically I'm curious, uh, I know Peter, you've been very involved with things like the, the, the effort to display the Enola Gay and, and the huge controversy in the mid-1990s over this, uh, so the role of people who you might say scholarly historians who might already know some of these things. Do you have a sense for why this particular story has remained if not untold, un unassimilated for so long. What, what are your thoughts on that broader uh, you know, challenge? It's a difficult, sensitive topic to deal with for a while. Especially members of the World War II generation. The soldiers, as you see, were told that the atomic bombs saved their lives, that they were about to invade, they would likely have been killed, and Truman was a hero. And I deal often with veterans. I, I'd love to present this material to them, because we're actually going further in arguing that the, uh, that the statement that the bomb ended the war actually in some ways denigrates the soldiers and their contribution, people who were fighting in the Pacific, people who actually won the war. It also demeans the role of the Soviet Union, certainly, in helping end the war. It's a very sensitive topic, and, and, and which is why the Enola Gay uh, exhibit mm -hmm. got canceled in 1994, 1995 at, at the Smithsonian. The United States was not yet ready to have a serious discussion about the atomic bombing. Other topics we could, but not that, because it gets, as Oliver was saying, it's so central to our core sense of ourselves as a nation, our sense of our goodness, 
and the first person to talk about, about American exceptionalism, if we, if Americans really understood that the bomb was not necessary, that the stories told about it were misleading, uh, that the war ended for other reasons, that American leaders knew that the war would likely end for other reasons, and that would force us to make a, a different kind of self-criticism and look inwardly in a way that we've chosen not to do as a nation. Most Americans still believe in American exceptionalism. Oliver fought in Vietnam. The latest Gallup poll shows that 18 that the Vietnam War was worth fighting, that it was a necessary war. 51% of 18 to 29 year olds. Is this, there are, uh, there's this core view of the world that's what Oliver and I are trying to challenge, and, and I think the bomb is at the heart of that. So even though younger Americans tend to be more critical than older Americans about, about the atomic bombing, uh, the latest surveys on this look like we've lost ground again. The latest survey shows more, a higher percentage of Americans actually support the atomic bombing now than did maybe 10 years ago. Well, I feel even more strongly than I think Peter. I felt like the utter, the utter futility of trying to do a project like this became more evident to me. I was in Moscow for the, the last uh, few weeks, and uh, seeing this from the Russian point of view was totally, totally uh, two different planets. Uh, and uh, it seems that, again, the, the United States and Western Europe, and Eastern Europe in this case, have all banded together in one, one group think uh, to blast the uh, the Russians again as the evil bad guys, the new Stalins of history. This is an old story. It goes back. It seems of exceptionalism. The uh, Obama praising NATO, which has moved eastward contrary to the promises given to Gorbachev after the end of the Cold War, is moving eastward. And the praise of NATO that he gave is just a, a, a regression, almost a regression to Cold War thinking again. Fact check, CBS, Showtime fact check, our own fact check. 
Peter would break my chops about something that uh, was excessive. I'd go back to Peter and say, this is really boring. And, <laughs> and vice versa, by the way. And we'd go back and forth. I mean, it was, it was a grueling experience. I don't ever want to repeat it. I never want to do another documentary like this. Something I could afford to. But it was, at the end of the day, I learned a hell of a lot. And I hope other people will appreciate it over time. Because it was made for time. It was not. It was made to last. I, my model was uh, World at War, the BBC, 1970s. They really did it. Although it was very pro-British and very anti-Russian, also it was still a magnificent document of that of that war effort. Well done, but by a staff of about 50 people, whereas we had a staff of about five to ten. Uh, I was curious, in a more oblique way, uh, in an interview in London a couple of years ago, uh, you made the comment that uh, <clears throat> no lobby uh, in Washington is as powerful as Israel, and uh, it's been effing up American foreign policy uh, for many years. Uh, Truman not only presided over the uh, creation of the atomic bomb, he presided over the creation uh, of Israel as well. Uh, I wonder if uh, perhaps uh, you could duly take into task with that and some other comments you made about World War II. Uh, I wonder if perhaps uh, you ever thought of uh, writing or uh, filming the uh, untold history of the lobby and its uh, influence over American foreign policy. It's a great subject, and certainly uh, I think if you do with this country, you're not going to get it on the air. How, how can you, you know, it's, you can criticize Israel far more than you can Israel than you can here. As to truth, because he's really, he knows far more about it than I do. And where Wallace stood on, on Israel, too. And, and Marshall, because they were, they were not. Right. <clears throat> uh, there was a lot of opposition to the recognition of Israel in the U.S. government in the late 1940s. Uh, Truman actually represented a minority position. Other people in the administration anticipated the kind of history that actually happened, uh, the kind of ongoing warfare, the uh, claims of the Palestinians. Among them was George Marshall. And Marshall told Truman that he would never vote for him again if Truman recognized Israel in that way. So there were other options, but the interesting thing is that two countries that were competing first recognized Israel with the United States and the Soviet Union. And they did so almost simultaneously. Uh, a lot of Americans were concerned because Israel at that point seemed to be so left-wing. That there were so many socialists and communists in Israel back in the late 40s that a lot of conservative American policymakers were actually concerned about what Israel's allegiance would be. So from the very beginning, uh, as Dulles talks about, as Secretary of State, when he came back from his first trip to the Middle East, he said the people there hate us. They hate us, first of all, because they think that we're the new inheritors of original French colonialism, and they hate us because of our close ties to Israel. So by early 1950s, it was already becoming clear in the region that the United States was very closely tied to Israel. But Israel, during that time, was a much more progressive country. And now we know of it as it very right-wing country and playing that kind of role globally. But Israel was not always uh, that kind of conservative country. It actually has a very uh, kind of left-wing origins in many ways. And the Israel lobby, I of course agree with Oliver about it, that it's got an outsized influence. Uh, and it doesn't really represent American Jews. Uh, Ameri most American Jews have a much more aggressive view and does the Israel lobby. The Israel lobby, if it was talking about APAC, is representing the Israel lobby, is a, is a very conservative group. They, they are uh, little with neocons. They're very much in favor of the invasion of Iraq. Most Israelis, as all we're saying, are, are more nuanced in, the, in their views. There's a lot of more open discussion in Israel. Uh, not too long ago, the Israelis were polled, and 64% of Israelis said that they wanted a nuclear-free Middle East, even if that meant Israel giving up all of its nuclear weapons. So there's a, a, a more progressive strain, because there are new 
uh, people coming into Israel who do represent a much more conservative tendency. But in Israel, these things can be debated. In the United States, Oliver said a couple of controversial things, uh, and they came down on us. Uh, at our first press conference in Los Angeles, the, at the Television Critics Annual Conference, Oliver talked about needing to walk in the shoes of people he makes films about. He said, I sometimes make films about people I despise, like George Bush and Ronald Reagan, but I've got to be able to see the world from their perspective in order to do that. He says the same thing with, with this documentary. I've got to be able to understand the perspective of Hitler and Stalin. And the headlines were, uh, Oliver Stone to humanize Hitler. I mean, so there are certain very sensitive, hot button issues that you have to be very careful about, about in, uh, in making, talking about publicly or, or making these kinds of documentaries. We haven't gotten attacked for our documentary from that perspective. That has not been an issue that people have attacked us for. We're very even-handed when it comes to dealing with issues in the Middle East and issues in US foreign policy, where Israel worked in conjunction with the CIA to train those death squads that Oliver was talking about in Central America. Of course, we talk about that, where Israel helps South Africa develop its atomic bomb. We talk about that. But we don't, in any way, demonize the Israelis as somehow uh, uniquely responsible. There's a lot of bad things going on in the world, and we think that what's happening in, uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians is one of them. But we're looking for a more positive solution to that problem. Thank you both, and um, and MIT. I have a general question and a particular question. The general question is <coughs> personal in a way. What motivates men like you to uh, fight against the grain of not only of settled opinion and the New York Times line, but these deeply ingrained emotional investments we have in our virtue, we as human beings, we as Americans. Um, and is is there a hope there somewhere that the truth? will make us free, or are we just doing this to create a record, or is it a totally hopeless but noble cause, or what? The particular question has to do with the, the assassination of JFK. And I know you, Mr. Stone, have been, uh, to, to my mind, one of the supporters of James Douglas in the book JFK and the Unspeakable, which uh, makes that you know, maybe a, another big marker with the, with the deconstruction of Henry Wallace of something went profoundly wrong in our world, and yet, even on the 50th anniversary, it was almost impossible to get anything like that discussion going in a public space. So, generals and particulars, I, I admire your work, both of you, and I, but I, I wonder, how do, we, how, do we, um, how do we keep you going? <laughs> well, uh, your, answer, your question is far more eloquent than my answer could be. I think you said everything I feel. Uh, and why do we do it? Why do people do it? Because certain people discover a, a thing inside themselves, call it a conscience. And unless they honor that thing, uh, they cannot live well. And it becomes a personal choice. Uh, believe me, uh, I'm not stupid, and I would get out of the way of a fireball if I saw one. And uh, there is a big one uh, in this country. It's just started up again. We had it uh, during the Bush years. We had it uh, the Carthyism that I saw as a young man. It was frightening. I remember vividly uh, my father being conservative, making fun in a, in, a, in, a, in a humorous way, making fun of liberals who came to our house, our apartment, and had dinner, and people who were working in corporations, but they were never going to get ahead. Never. They were very rare, unless they had inherited art, of which there were quite a few. It was very difficult to be uh, an outspoken person in the 1950s. I remember that as a six-year-old, seven-year-old, ten-year-old, just listening to conversations of adults was fascinating. So uh, America has been through this place before. And what we saw with the Bush, with the Dixie Chicks, and all that false, uh, hyped-up patriotism, and we still see it. Very much, uh, having been a soldier, I, mean, I can look it in the eye and say, this is wrong, this is false. This is false pride, this is false causality. And when they talk about Russia as the new aggressor, I mean, this is again a false causality. Uh, whereas people are not looking at what matters. And uh, 
course, the JFK assassination, I agree totally with Mark Lane, his great summation. He was recently asked, he said, so Mark, uh, do you have any uh, new evidence? And he says, so, uh, no, but what's wrong with the old evidence? <laughs> I think the old evidence is so crystal clear that day that you have to be a really a stupid person as a scientist, which you have to, as a physicist, would realize that that shooting out that window, three shots by so-called Oswald, would have done that, what it did, is just physically impossible. You can prove it perhaps on a, on a, on a, on a blackboard, but you can't do it, prove it in real space and time. No one has. So uh, anyway, I stand up for what I believe, but I'm not going to run into the next one. If, if, I, you know, if I see something that's very dangerous, I would be very cautious, because I think we're going to another period of great madness, collective madness, and I am scared. But uh, I, w I did put out a few pieces, and Peter has put out some pieces and editorials and Facebook and so on. You know, we try. And if we don't keep talking, and the Noam Chomsky's keep talking out of this school and the, and the other wonderful academics and professors, if we don't keep talking, no one's going to hear anything except one voice, the voice of Barack Obama. I guess I'll, I'll just add a little bit to that, because I came from all of this from a very different perspective than Oliver did. And growing up uh, as a child, my first memories of anything dealing with politics was listening to my grandmother uh, talking about all the relatives who killed the Holocaust. And I just remember, remember my grandmother sitting there at the kitchen table crying about this, because more than half of my relatives were, were killed in the Holocaust. But the lesson that I was that the worst thing you can do is close your eyes to evil. And I grew up with that idea of the good Germans and the people who remain silent in the face of Nazi atrocities as the epitome of what of wrongdoing, of, of tolerating evil, and that if you tolerate evil, uh, then it's going to, you're going to have the rise of fascism in some sense. I grew up with that in my mind, so I was very active in civil rights very young, I joined the NAACP when I was 12, and then CORE, and, and then I became, Oliver was born in Vietnam, I was very active in the anti-war movement during that time, but it was always from that same moral reference point of looking at what happened in Germany as the ultimate danger of what can happen in any country if people don't stand up for what's right, and we see it happening now. Uh, um, there are people who stand up. My former student, Ryan Shapiro, is here. And uh, as Dave mentioned before, uh, Ryan has been leading the fight uh, uh, for the NSA and uh, CIA for, for FOIA requests, uh, trying to expose what's going on. Uh, and Ryan's been all over the news lately, and very, people at MIT should be very proud of him for standing up so articulately, so heroically, and fighting against surveillance, fighting against the secrecy. Obama, as we all know, promised to be the transparency president. And under Obama, the United States is more secretive, more information is classified, more surveillance is going on, just the exact opposite of, of those of us who voted for him, what we thought we were voting for. And, uh, and if that's what's happening now, we understood that during the Bush years. And the danger was, the question we kept raising, would any future president give back those powers that Bush had accumulated? And the answer clearly is no. Uh, so we're facing, you know, our, our democracy is very, very fragile right now. We learn it every day, it's more fragile. So it's essential that we stand up on principle as loud as we can if we have any hope for this country. And, and if not any hope for this country, then any hope for the future of mankind. Well, Judge, uh, <laughs> Judge Roberts won't agree with you. I had a, a question about the formation of the, the mythological narrative. It's easy to understand how, starting with Truman's uh, post bombing speech, that uh, Americans have need to believe that the bomb saves us. Veterans that like, had their lives saved directly, and that the American people were did not have blood on their hands because this thing did what was being perfected for. But the view elsewhere in the world was inconsistent with this. I mean, UN Resolution One uh, passed unanimously called for the immediate abolition of nuclear weapons. 
And so, presumably the rest of the world did not, I mean, I guess it's a question, the rest of the world see it like we did, and then why did the, the view harbored by the rest, the rest of the world not succeed? Was it the Cold War? What, what exactly, you know, the threat of Soviet invasion of Europe? What, what happened to allow the American commit to live on? In the United States, it was clearly very one-sided. We mentioned in the documentary that 85% of the American people thought the atomic bombing was a good thing. But I don't think we mentioned there that 23% of Americans said they wished the Japanese had not surrendered so quickly so we could have dropped more atomic bombs on them. In the southwest of the United States, 30% of the people felt that way. So almost a third in some parts of the country, the public, wanted to drop more atomic bombs. Uh, as Subrata was saying, in India, he grew up with the vision that we're presenting in the documentary, that that's almost a unanimous view in India, and that's the case in much of the world. Uh, but once the United States becomes the dominant superpower in the world, and the United States controls, if not the narrative, uh, the United States uh, it can ignore what other people think, what other countries think. When do we pay attention to international opinion really, on, on any of these matters? Uh, look at the opinion of the United States, especially during the Iraq War. The American public, the international view of the United States plummeted uh, during the Iraq War. And we were disdainful. I mean, what, it doesn't really hurt us in that way. But, well, Albert was talking again his frustration about what's happening now. To hear Obama or Kerry or Hillary Clinton speak about the horrors of what the Russians did in Crimea, and I got my own criticism of what they're doing, but to do as so as if we are worse than that, to not see the bad things of hypocrites who just invaded Afghanistan, invaded Iraq, invaded Libya, wanted to bomb the hell out of Syria. I mean, in an operation that which practically nobody's been injured uh, in the Russian takeover, where the United States is responsible for, indirectly or directly, for hundreds of thousands and probably millions of deaths in these situations. The hypocrisy is so striking to me, but that Americans don't get that shows how Americans are out of step with the rest of the world. Or in Vietnam, I mentioned before that 51% of 18 to 29 year olds think it's a good war. When I asked my students how many Americans died in the war, some of them know 58,000 or 58,272 names on the wall. I asked them how many Vietnamese died in the war. They might say 100,000, half million, the really smart ones might say a million. I tell them that Robert McNamara, when he came into my class, said that he accepts that 3.8 million Vietnamese died in the war. They have no idea. And then, of course, my mind goes back to the Holocaust. Well, what if? What would, what would we think if we found out that the average German student thought that a uh, half million Jews died in the Holocaust, or a million Jews? We'd be horrified that they know so little history, that they have no responsibility for their past. Uh, and but the Americans are in the exact same position. American students don't know their history. The American public doesn't know their history, which is what motivated us in large part to do this project, because we're fighting an uphill battle, but it, ha it has to begin someplace. And we saw this as a weapon that can be used by progressive forces in order to, to cultivate a different view of history and to try to spread that view because we think people's actions in the present are greatly influenced by their views of the past. And if the Americans think that the atomic bombing was justified, that everything the United States has done for the last 70 or 100 years is justified, then, they, then, we, then we do the kinds of things we continue to do without having any perspective. We're trying to get a discussion going to get, give people a different kind of perspective. Uh, I'd like to ask a question and make a comment. My name is John Thompson, and as you may gather from my accent, I'm pretty. Uh, uh, I greatly welcome the sort of discussion that you have given us this evening. Uh, I'm very much in favor of historians raising questions such as you have done. Uh, I think that one of the big problems we have is conformism, that uh, I'm really struck by how little, except for obvious party political advantage, 
how little confidence it there is in this country. And I'm sorry to say that America is not so exceptional in the sense that it's the same in Britain. I'm sorry if I wasn't holding this high enough. <laughs> My personal response was to go to the nearest bookshop and buy two books, both of which I thought might be important. Uh, one was Hobbes' of Bathroom, and the other was St. Francis' Little Flowers. Uh, I think the Leviathan has uh, had the advantage uh, since 1945. But it's important, uh, as you pointed out, to keep the other in mind as well. I also think, because I happen to have uh, a lot of scientists around me, and including people who were involved with making the bomb, that there was much more of a moral discussion in the late 1940s, or from 1945 onwards, than there ever has been since. Which points to the importance of understanding what you're talking about. Uh, I think most of the scientists that I know did feel that, yes, on balance, they uh, were just right to drop the bomb. Um, I think, I do think it was rather difficult not to, once it had been discovered. Um, I just that's a point of view which I think you don't agree with, but uh, uh, there were a lot of people at the time, and people who really were deeply involved and deeply concerned morally about this situation, uh, who did feel that it was on balance the right thing to do. I would also raise questions about uh, the, the beginning of the Cold War. I, I do myself think that uh, it was difficult to suppose that uh, Stalin was not going to do more or less what he actually did. I don't think that it was the Western uh, actions that pushed him into doing something in the things that he did.
And the one thing we were determined to do was to try and avoid any use of nuclear weapons. And, and incidentally, in a lot of war games, both in Washington and in Europe, uh, the people running the war games were constantly frustrated because they couldn't get the participants to take the decision to use a nuclear weapon. I, I think you've given us about three hours worth of things to talk about. <laughs> 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 uh, do, you want, do you want to make some uh, brief responses and then? Okay. I, I'll try to be, I'll try to be brief. Uh, the first thing you mentioned was about the scientists and their attitude. Well, Leslie Groves conducted a survey of scientists in Los Alamos. And I think it was 85% of them who supported a demonstration, not dropping the bomb. The scientists who weighed in were the Science Advisory Committee to the Interim Committee. And that was Oppenheimer, uh, Arthur Holly Compton, Lawrence, and Fermi. And they said they had, they, that was, they had no choice but to use the bomb. When Oppenheimer was later asked about that, he said, when I said that, he said, we didn't know beans about the situation. We didn't know that the Russians were about to enter the war. We didn't know that the Japanese were trying to surrender. Most scientists then and later, and the scientists really begin to change in, in large part is after John Hersey's Hiroshima was published in the summer of 1946. Because what that book does is it humanizes the victims. For the first time, the Japanese become human beings. And then a lot of the scientists, even more than initially, had a lot of moral qualms about it. So that the scientists were largely divided and many of them were outspoken, including, including Oppenheimer later. We saw the scene there about Oppenheimer saying, I have blood on my hands. And Truman said, oh, blood's on my hands. I can't get blood out of the office. I don't want to see it again. Uh, but, but Oppenheimer was typical of the scientists, many of whom, that's the interesting thing about scientists, they were the ones who led the fight for abolition of nuclear weapons. Unlike the chemists after World War I, who were proud of what they did, and fought against the Geneva Protocols to ban chemical warfare, the scientists were in the forefront because, as the, I think it was Time Magazine wrote, they're the world's guilty people, because they felt very badly about it, especially as they learned more about what the actual situation was. So far as Stalin and the origins of the Cold War, that's, we have a whole two episodes, really, but the next episode four deals with that directly. Uh, and there's uh, lots to be said, let me just give you broad, quickly outline a couple of points that we try to focus on. Rosa talked about the three policemen, the United States, Britain, and the Soviets, joined the role of the world. Roosevelt's last telegram he wrote was to Churchill saying that these issues, like Poland, come up every day. We shouldn't make a big deal of it because we can work these all out. Roosevelt was sure that we were going to maintain friendship afterwards, as was Wallace. Truman takes office on the, Roosevelt dies on April 12th. Truman's first day in office is April 13th. By the time Molotov comes to visit on April 23rd, everything is turned around. By then when he meets Molotov, he's accusing the Russians of having broken all their agreements at Yalta, broken all their agreements over Poland. Uh, and when he said, they Bragg said, I gave it to him one, two to the jaw. He says, well, we can't get 100% of what we want, we should at least get 85%. And he treats him as an enemy immediately. Stalin came, writes to him the next day and says, this is, you're going against everything in my understanding with Roosevelt. Uh, initially, the Soviets desperately wanted to maintain friendship with the United States for economic as well as political reasons. They had just lost 27 billion. The country, Kennedy says, it was as if the entire United States east of Chicago had been destroyed what the Soviets suffered. They didn't want war, they didn't want enmity, but the agreement and Yalta, Roosevelt floated the reparations figure of $20 billion, half of which was supposed to go to the Soviet Union to help them rebuild. But Stalin wanted that desperately. He wanted to make friendly relations. When Roosevelt died, even Harriman said he couldn't believe the sincerity of Stalin's despair over Roosevelt's death. And the one person they trusted in that capacity was Wallace. But Truman flips it very quickly. And the Soviets wanted friendly governments in, in Eastern Europe. They didn't demand lockstep dictatorships. And those governments don't start take, getting into coming to effect until 1947-48. We had a window there of a couple of years when we could have had a very different beginning and, and possibly avoided the Cold War in, uh, completely. Uh, not that those would have been governments I would like to see, because they were based on the Russian model, and the Russian model was never democratic, and it's hardly democratic now. Uh, but there could have been 
the Cold War, you say that uh, the Cold War, there was no fighting. Uh, there's a, a lot of dead, millions and millions and millions of dead people out there who might disagree if they were still alive. Uh, so there were all these proxy wars going on. We didn't use the nuclear weapons, but we came within a seconds of doing it almost during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, we, we deal with that in our episode six in great detail. The real history of the Cuban Missile Crisis is hardly known and hardly appreciated. And the United States submarine was dropping depth charges. The United States ships were dropping depth charges on the Soviet submarine. The power went out. They thought the World War had started. What the United States didn't realize was that that sub had nuclear torpedoes on board. And the commander gave the order to fire the nuclear torpedo. And if the sub command, the second commander, Arkhipov, didn't talk him down, the nuclear war would have started. He came that close. The lesson that Kennedy and Khrushchev learned from the Cuban Missile Crisis is that once these crises begin, despite all our efforts, we can't control them. I think they ra unravel, they go out of control. Kennedy and Khrushchev were both desperately trying to prevent a war in 1962, and they both realized that they had no control over the situation, which is why Kennedy, uh, part of why Kennedy has such a dramatic change of heart the last year of his presidency, and why Khrushchev reaches out in such a positive way. He said, let's resolve every crisis between us. These conflicts are too dangerous. We can't let them go on, which is why you look at what's happening now, and you've got all these hawks who are trying to fan the flames of controversy and conflict, not realizing that the United States and Russia still have thousands of nuclear weapons pointed at each other on hair trigger alert. Uh, it's a very dangerous situation, and, and we have to do everything we can to resolve those crises, not to fuel them in this situation. Well, let's see you guys. Hi, thank you so much. I have a quick question. It's pretty um, specific about the, the day of the Nagasaki bombing. I think in the film, if I understood you correctly, you said that we didn't give the Japanese time to kind of, um, even adjust or think through what was happening with the Russians having invaded that morning or that middle of the night. And my impression from my research, which I'm doing right now on this topic, is that uh, the big six, the, the kind of core Japanese cabinet members, um, were in debate on the morning of the Jap of the Nagasaki bombing, um, and they weren't. Even though they were debating surrender, they weren't anywhere close because half of them, the militarists, wanted um, more more conditions uh, of, of surrender, more terms of surrender than than the the the, the pacifists or the the, the the ones who are wanting to surrender, and so. It, sound, it seems to me, and I, uh, the, I know you know more about this than I do, that that the that the um, for the militarists in the Japanese government, the invasion of uh, the, the Russian or the Russian uh, entry into the war didn't seem to have an impact that day. And I wondered if you know any more about that. It had an impact immediately. Uh, they immediately went to Togo with the foreign ministry. Uh, and told him that morning what happened, that the Soviets were invading the swarms, and uh, Togo said, we have to end the war. Uh, Suzuki, when he was asked, Prime Minister Suzuki, when he was asked, why do we have to end the war so quickly, he said, the Russians were already in uh, Karafuto and the Kuril Islands and, uh, and Hokkaido. So he said, tomorrow they'll be in Hokkaido, they're already in Korea. And he said, we have to uh, immediately uh, Surrender to the Americans while we have the chance. They got word actually that the United States had a hundred more atomic bombs and that Tokyo was the next target. And even that didn't change their view. They had been, one of the key things to realize is that the United States had been firebombing Japanese cities since uh, May. Uh, the United States had firebombed actually over a hundred Japanese cities. And the Japanese were accepting that the United States could wipe out Japanese cities. We wiped out 99.5% of the city of Toyama. Once they accepted that as a necessary course of war. But they kept saying in their communiques that 
invade, Soviet invasion will mean the end of the empire. They said that starting in May and repeatedly after that point. So this was what they dreaded the most. They tried, their whole strategy was to keep the Soviets out of the war. And the Soviets came in, and that changes the calculus, because their Ketsu Go strategy based on face up two things. The diplomatic strategy was to get the Soviets to negotiate to get the better surrender terms. Their military strategy was to have the Americans invade and inflict heavy casualties on the Americans. And that was based upon keeping the Soviets out of the war. Once the Soviets came in, they lived through the Kwantung army in Manchuria almost overnight. Everybody was shocked how quickly. Uh, and then they were moving toward the Japanese mainland. So that's really what, what changes the equation. Uh, and if you look at the statements, you might have read the statements by the various cabinet officers. That's what they point to repeatedly. And the American post-war reports said the same thing. So that people would latch on to the bombing as an excuse. But we looked at the, the discussions of the Japanese cabinet, and almost nobody talked about the atomic bomb. It's all about the Soviet invasion. So I think it's very clear that that's what changes the equation. And Truman made a lot of statements to that effect also. He said uh, in April, on August 17th for Potsdam, uh, Stalin will be in the Jap war, finny Japs when that occurs. And the important thing is that Truman understands this. He refers to the uh, July, uh, July 18th telegram, the telegram from the Jap emperor asking for peace. In fact, evidence after evidence that they knew the situation, but yet they wanted to use the bombs, and uh, that was the invasion that actually did make a difference. As a research uh, topic, uh, there's a wonderful movie made by the Japanese called Japan's Longest Day. You should see it. Have you seen it? It goes, in, it, it's not as uh, historically, perhaps, uh, in depth, but it has the, the nuance of those days. The, uh, actually, the, the militarists, the junior officers, had their desire to fight on to what that meant. And that, but the junior officers are depicted as not having the weight of the senior officers. So uh, you must see the movie. It's quite well done. It's Japan's Longest Day, 1990. We have time for one final question. I see a uh, hand up in the, in the back. Or, 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 or. I, I don't need that phone. My well, Patrick Wilson. I'm from Occupy Boston Radio. I just wanted a quick comment on the Supreme Court decision. <laughs> Here comes the mic. Wait. You know, just, just the last part. Uh, I'm Patrick Wilson from Occupy Boston Radio. I just wanted a quick comment on the Supreme Court decision from yesterday. If you'd like to get one. It'll cost you, literally. I, I'm a, a, as a dramatist. I, I just when I read this this morning on the plane over here, I felt tremendous defeat and collapse. I felt like this is it. You know, I mean, we've had so much ample evidence. I thought 2010 was would have been the end of that story, but on the contrary, it seems that the Supreme Court has really betrayed us, the American Constitution especially since 2000, the 2000 election, in my opinion, was the beginning of this process, and it doesn't stop. Today's was like, you know, bury us under a mudslide, for Christ's sake. There's no coming out of this now. Peter, you give it a little more historical version. Of it. It a very historical answer, because we could see the roots of this in the Federalist Papers in the, in the 1780s. John Jay said the people who own the country ought to, ought to govern it. Uh, that goes way back you know, a long time, over 200 years. Uh, now they've got it. Uh, I mean, as I said before, our democracy is, is very fragile. Uh, again, this whole notion of American exceptionalism, that we're going to teach the rest of the world about constitutions and about democracy, but what we actually have here is much more of a plutocracy. I mean, you have a situation in which the richest one-tenth of one percent have more wealth than the poorest 90 percent, I mean, our Republican tradition, small our Republican tradition, was based on the notion that for people, for a democracy to exist, then there's got to be a rough equality of wealth between people. What we've seen now is, is the lobbyists and, uh, and the money that goes into the elections, the decisions. The thing about the crisis in, in 2008 and what we've seen since then, is they don't have to break the laws in order to run the country. They write the laws in the first place. And then and now they're putting so much money into, into this, potentially, that they're trying to drown out the voice of the, the public. And, and uh, we're seeing the effect of that. And I, I think democracy is very fragile, and it's, it behooves us all to really stand up there and to defy them. Uh, one of our concerns is that if you look at the policies of Hillary Clinton, 
who's the, the anointed, the Democratic candidate, uh, she supported the invasion of Afghanistan, she supported the invasion of Iraq, she supported the invasion of Libya, she supported the bombing of Syria. I mean, there's hardly a hawkish position which she can't, she doesn't embrace. Yes, she's more progressive on her domestic policies, and she's intelligent, and it's certainly time we had a woman president, but I'd much rather have it be Elizabeth Warren than, than, than him. <laughs> Peter and Oliver, I know we have to end, so I'll be very brief, but I do have a comment on what you said about uh, this going, uh, going back to this original sort of interpretation of our, uh, our appreciation amongst public about why the bomb was dropped, that uh, numbers are shifting back. Um, there is the dichotomy that support for nuclear weapons in the United States has been dropping. And uh, in, 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 in polls that are conducted by peace groups. So there is, I think, that dichotomy. And I would also put a little bit of optimism in the assessment of the current situation. That is what we learned from how the war on Iraq, was, I mean, on Syria, was stopped. Yeah, the support for Congress is at sort of all time low, 6% or less. And the American people are sick and tired of wars. Yes. So, and, 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 and I think one of the things Oliver and I wrote about that was that we applauded Putin for finding a formula that would prevent the bombing of Syria. We only wish he hadn't done it so soon. Because if he had waited a few more days, Congress was going to repudiate Obama on the uh, bombing of Syria. The numbers were very strong. Uh, it was almost certain that that was going to be rejected by Congress. And that would have been, I think, the most important triumph for the anti-war movement in decades. So, uh, that, uh, but on the negative side, when we deal with nuclear weapons, I just want to mention that our dear friend Jonathan Shell passed away last week. And if anybody had been a warrior for nuclear disarmament for the past 30 years, uh, it was Jonathan Shell. So, uh, yes, the attitudes are changing because people like you and uh, Jonathan Shell have been out there fighting this fight. So. Thank you very much. So, I